Katamarie, Tafana, o Te Ope Fokaora. Welcome to everyone, and I want to especially welcome those who are joining us here at Christchurch City uh, on this Sunday morning from around the four nations of our territory here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. Welcome. Hare mai. It's great to have you worshipping with us together. Now, I understand that there is a children's program, and uh, children, I can see them filing out right now. You're very welcome to join that program. We're going to join uh, together in reading the scripture from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, please. And I'm reading from verse 1, Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put my breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up to their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. May God add fresh meaning and blessing to the reading of his word this morning. It gives me great pleasure to welcome someone who is well known to us, Commissioner Lyndon Buckingham, Chief of the Staff. Uh, it's great to have you back in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in our territory, Lyndon. You're going to get a great welcome because we know you, we know you love the Lord, and we're going to listen to as, as you preach the word of the Lord. Welcome, Linda. I don't know what you did, but it's working. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo. It's so good to be able to look out and see familiar faces. And it's a joy for me to be able to greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
and to bless you this morning. And to those of you who are joining in, I don't even know where to look, from wherever you are around the territory, I feel so honored and privileged and blessed uh, to be able to speak to you this morning. I have to tell you, it's so good to be at home, to touch my own land. It's fantastic. And uh, to be in worship with you this morning uh, before this great King of Kings that is ours is such a beautiful experience, and I already feel uh, encouraged and, sadly for you, somewhat pumped up by the whole experience and determined to make the most of the opportunity because I have no idea when I will be back again. I've been using a verse of Scripture uh, this year, and uh, I want to use it again this morning for you. And I'm going to test your response as I share this verse. It comes out of a beautiful letter that Paul wrote uh, to the Colossians, to the church in Colossae. Uh, It's a beautiful letter, his letter. It's full of wonderful truth and affirmation. And in the opening of that beautiful letter, he makes this statement. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> you see, that, that's the reaction that I've been getting everywhere I've been this year and used this verse. And on every occasion, I've had to say it again. So I will. <laughs> Let's see what happens in the house when I read it for a second time. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Okay. Well, that's the truth. Hello. That is the truth this morning. All over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. The stories out of New Zealand, Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa tell the truth of that story. That all over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Lives are being transformed. People are coming to salvation. People are being given new hope. People are being lifted up. Barriers are being broken down. New life is emerging all over the world. People are coming to know the Savior. Hello. Oh, now you're warming up. Man, I only had to get to double 40 to get it out of you. But at least it's coming out of you. It's a wonderful thing, the privilege of my particular role at the moment means that I get to see evidence of the fact that it's happening in the wider church around the world, but also it's happening within the Salvation Army. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Men and women and young people coming to faith, coming to understand something of God's love revealed to them in the person of Jesus Christ. Coming to new life, new hope, and then putting themselves to the task, to the privilege, to the work of coming alongside God who is busy in the world, redeeming and reclaiming and reforming and revitalizing his people, drawing them unto himself. And all around the world, under the banner of the Salvation Army, men and women and young people just like you, filled with the Spirit of God, are carrying out His work in the world. It's not in the newspapers. It's not broadcast on the television. That causes some people to think, I wonder if it is happening. I wonder if we're losing ground. I wonder if our best days are gone. No. The truth is, even today, as a result of faithful salvationists around the world and others who call on the name of the Lord. Barriers are being broken down and people are coming to understand God's love for them as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So you might ask the question, well, if you're all excited about that, and I am so much so that my mouth is dry, (laughs) if you're all excited about that, 
Why would you choose a scripture like that one in Ezekiel, uh, a valley of dry old bones? Why would you make reference to a people who were saying, it's, hope is gone, we're just like dry bones, it's finished, it's over. In the context of the scripture, children of Israel are exiled, they're in Babylon, there's, there's trouble in the camp, uh, they are distraught, they are feeling abandoned, they are feeling alone, they are feeling there is no hope for them. And in the vision that Ezekiel has, uh, he is taken to a valley of dry bones and he is told this is what the people of Israel feel they are, that the best days are behind them, that it's all gone, that it's all washed up, that we're not making any impact anymore, that that which we were designed to be and that which we were designed to do, we're not doing anymore. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. And I'm sad to say that even within the context of our movement, there are people who say that kind of speak. There are people who believe that our best days, that our most impactful days, that the days when we were at the edge, when the days where we were making a huge difference and an impact around the world, those days are behind us. And that we're giant bones. We're all washed up. There are people who think that within our movement paralyzed by a lack of hope, paralyzed by some myth that we're no longer able to be a powerful force in the hand of God. And it simply is not true. Oh, dear me. It simply is not true. Do you have to work this hard every Sunday, Gordon? You do. That's why we pay you so much, right? So, why we pay you so much. <laughs> you know, I've heard a lot of messages about the uh, Valley of the Dry Bones, and there's a lot of focus on uh, the bones. But the whole point of this story, actually, the whole point of this vision is not to get us to focus on the hopelessness of the situation or the desperation, but to think about the question that's being posed to Ezekiel. Because the question that's being posed to Ezekiel is this, can these bones live? Now, if you're standing there and the Lord of hosts, the creator of the universe, is asking you that question, you may not want to answer immediately. Is it a trick question? Um, I think they could. Uh, they They might be. Only you alone would know, Lord. Good answer. Smart man. Only you alone would know. Can these bones live? This is a question of faith. This is a question of confidence. This is a question of hope. This is a question that says, look at me and then answer this question. Look at me and then answer this question. This vision is about God himself. This is who it's about. This vision is about God. This is a question that is being asked. Do you believe that I have the power, Ezekiel, to make these bones live? Do you believe that I, God, the creator of the universe, have the capacity to step into something that might seem hopeless, that might seem over, that might seem dead, that might seem forgotten, that might be assumed best days in the past? Do you have confidence? Do you have faith to believe that I can step into that, that I can step into a valley of dry bones? Do you have the faith to believe, the confidence to believe, the hope to believe that I can step in there and put on flesh, that I can breathe into it, that I can cause it to stand, and that I can make it live again? That's a powerful question to ask. And the only way to be able to answer that question in the affirmative is to have a strong idea in your mind and in your heart of who it is that's asking the question. God, the creator, who reveals himself as holy and righteous and powerful and graceful, and merciful, and loving, and kind, and patient, and life-giving. 
The same God who parts waters and tears down walls, who declares to Lazarus to come out of the tomb and live again, who dies on a cross and rises to life again. That same God is the God that's asking the question, can these bones live? Do you believe? Do you believe? In order to answer the question, we have to look at the one posing the question. God, the God of the universe, the one who holds it all and knows beginning from end, who today in 2019 is active in this world. He's working already. He's doing his business. He's already redeeming, rebuilding, revitalizing, renewing, bringing people to life. He's challenging. <laughs> he's transforming. He's liberating. He's setting free. This is the work that he's in right now, even today, as we sit in this house. This is the God. This is our God. This is the God we've been singing to this morning. This is the God we've been offering our praise to this morning. This is the God whom we have been saying this morning, Holy Spirit, come to us. Come to us. The question I would ask you this morning is why? Why do you want him to come? Why, why do you want him to come? What is it that you want him to come for? What is it that you want him to do when he comes? Why, why are you asking for him to come by his Holy Spirit to bless us? What, what for? It's an interesting question to ask. Why do we want him to come? This great God of the universe who has power. Why do you want him to come? When the Lord breathes life into someone, it's for a reason. It's for a purpose. It's not just for fun. It's not just because he can. When God brings something to life, he has reason and purpose for it. I wonder what that might be this morning as we think about the God that we worship. Why would he come to us this morning? Maybe he would come to us because he wants to increase our faith. He wants to increase our confidence in him. He wants to increase in us our confidence to proclaim his name, to lift him up, to be a people of praise. Maybe in 2019, what he needs more than anything is men and women and young people who are prepared to give him credit. He's here, he's real, he's active, he's engaged, he loves us. Let's give him praise and let's give him glory. Maybe the king will send his spirit to us so that we will look to him again and see how marvelous he is and how wonderful he is and how powerful he is. And as a result, we'll want to praise him. Get your praise on, people. The world needs to hear us praising the king, not hear there, out there in the world. Oh man, is it true? Are our best days behind us because we're no longer comfortable giving praise and credit and glory and declaring our allegiance to the king. He's worthy of it. He is the life giver. He is the redeemer. He is the restorer of all things. He will have his way. He brings life. He brings healing. He brings wholeness. He brings freedom. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of credit. He is worthy of testimony. He wants to raise up an army, a people around the globe who without hesitation and without any delay give him praise and give him glory and give him credit and speak his name with boldness and confidence. If the Spirit's going to come, He's going to come to empower us to do that. Surely. Surely. We look up. The Spirit will give us power to praise His name, to give Him credit, to give Him glory. Why would the Spirit come? If we said to Him, Spirit, come, Spirit, come, 
Maybe it's to increase our faith and to increase our praise. Maybe we could say, Spirit, come, and he comes because he wants to do something in us. Maybe there's a dry patch, a dry bone or two. Maybe there's some stuff. What do we say? Skeletons in our closet. Stuff that wears us down and binds us down and confuses us and holds us captive. Maybe when the Spirit comes, He comes because what He wants to do is some work in us. He wants to purify us. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to restore us. He wants to heal us that we might give Him glory, that we might give Him praise, that we might be an example of what it means to belong to the kingdom of God, that we might be men and women who live and breathe the values of the kingdom right where we live. He comes because he wants to do a work in us and me all. Yes, Lord, please, come and fill my dry places with your spirit. Set me on fire, Lord. Come. Yes, come and do something in my heart. Not just for my own blessing, but so that I can be a blessing. So I can be a testimony. So I can be a trophy of grace. So I can be an example of a person who's been brought to life. Come, Holy Spirit. Make that work happen here today. Why not? Why not, right? Why not? This is the God who can put flesh on dry bones and breathe life and make them live. Come and do something in me, not just for my sake, but for your sake, that I might be a living testimony of the transforming power of God. Do a work in me, Holy Spirit. But not just for me. Do it in me for the benefit of my family. Do it in me for the benefit of my relationships. Do it in me for the benefit of my community. (laughs) Don't just do it in me for me. Do it in me for others. So yes, Holy Spirit, come. We look up so that we might give you praise. We look in that you might do a work in me. We look around And recognize that what we want in our communities of faith is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? We want God, when he comes, he's going to do some work in us as communities of faith. He might challenge us to think about our attitudes towards each other. To the way in which we demonstrate the values of the kingdom of God within our places of worship. How we treat each other. How we talk to each other how we care for one another, how we ignore one another, how we fight one another. If the Spirit comes, He'll come and sort that stuff out. Right? Because we're supposed to be a beacon. We're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. There's something about our communities of faith that are supposed to be attractive and different. And it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. So if He comes, He's going to want to do some work in our communities of faith. We still want to invite Him? right? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Yes, Lord, we want your presence and your power to permeate every place where the Salvation Army shield is, every place where our flag is, every place where we open our doors, every place where we gather to pray and praise and worship together. We want you to be palpable presence in our places of worship. Come so that we might love each other. (laughs) Spirit of God, God of love, God of grace, God of mercy. We need your Holy Spirit to come to help us love each other. Come, Holy Spirit. We plead you, come. Come and increase our faith. Come and purify our hearts and make us holy and set us free. And come and empower us, Lord, to love each other, to care for each other, to be concerned for one another, to demonstrate the values of the kingdom of God to each other as brothers and sisters and believers. Come, Holy Spirit, to make our places of worship, our places of community, holy and clean and pure. Come and do that work. Man, we got some good reasons. We got some good reasons to ask the King to come down by His Spirit here this morning to us to increase our faith, 
to increase our faith, to increase our, increase our confidence, to purify our hearts, to grow within us the capacity to love and honor one another. Those are good enough reasons. <laughs> we've looked up, we've looked in, we've looked around. What about we look out? What about we look out beyond our places of worship and we think about the worlds in which we live and we might be overwhelmed by all of the stuff that goes on in the world that pushes against us. We might be overwhelmed by the darkness. We might be overwhelmed by the need. But isn't it not amazing to us that God the Holy Spirit is at work in our world and he's pushing back darkness and he's challenging evil and he's pushing back on greed and selfishness and anger and violence. And he's bringing love and grace and mercy. He's doing it. What about if we say, Holy Spirit, come and fill us because we want to be a part of what you're doing in the world. <laughs> we want to get on board with your activity and action in the world. <laughs> because our king is there. He's there, and he's there through his people. And brothers and sisters, it's true to tell you that in 2019, men and women and young people filled with the Spirit of God are seeking justice, are pursuing work on behalf of the vulnerable and the needy and the lonely and the broken and the forsaken, and they're bringing life and hope and healing and grace and forgiveness and acceptance and invitation and inclusion. And it's a beautiful thing. So if we ask the Holy Spirit to come to us, to our places, then we must be asking him to come because we want to be a part of the action. We want to be a part of the action. We don't want to be selfish. We don't want to say to him, oh, just increase our faith. We don't want to say to him, just clean up our lives. We don't want to say to him, just help us to get on with each other. We want to say, Lord, we want to be a part of what you are doing in the world. And we need your Holy Spirit. We need power. We need wisdom. We need grace. We need love. We need to know how to forgive. We need to know how to accept. We need to know how to sit alongside. We need courage to engage, Lord. That's why we say, Holy Spirit, come, because we don't want to just sit in the pew on a Sunday. We don't want to just be sucking up space on the planet. We want to make a contribution. We want to be a witness in the world. It's interesting to me. Uh, when you think about the metaphors that Jesus used, he used some beautiful metaphors. He said, you are to be salt in the world. You are to be like lights in the world. You're, you're supposed to be out there <laughs> being spirit-filled citizens of the kingdom of heaven. It's what we're supposed to be doing. Paul said that we are to be the aroma of Christ in the world. There's no good us just smelling good in here. I don't so much now, but I'm just getting too worked up. But it's no good us just smelling like Christ in here. We're supposed to be the aroma of Christ out there. That's the whole point. That's why he's left us here for now, to make a contribution, because he wants us to be his hands and his feet and his voice and his practical demonstration of what it means to be a part of his kingdom, the one that he's establishing, the one that he's building, the one that will last. It's based on love and forgiveness and grace and acceptance and worship of a holy God who's worthy of it. Worthy of it. So I agree with you, Commissioner Andy. Let's have encounter. Let's ask the Spirit to come. Let's call him down. Let's be relentless about it. Let's holler. Let's shout. Let's plead. Let's not give up. Let's call him down. Rain down. Come, Holy Spirit. Set me on fire. Get my feet tapping and dancing. Set me on fire. But for these reasons, for these reasons, that I might confidently, unapologetically praise you, glorify you, give you credit, come down so that I am clean, so I'm pure, <laughs> so I'm free, 
Come down. Come down. Come down so I can love my brothers and sisters. So I can sit around the table with them and maybe not agree on everything, but still love them. Still demonstrate Christ to them. Still create an atmosphere where I feel comfortable and everybody else that comes through the door feels equally comfortable. Come down so that I might have the power to engage in the things that the army is doing in the world. Right? A witness, a testimony, a helping hand, a loving person, a Christ-like aroma emanating from me wherever I am and what I'm putting my hands to. If we're saying, dear Lord, come down, breathe life into these dry old bones and make us live again. Why do you want me to come? For all of those reasons, Lord, come. And you know what? Those are all the reasons why he promised to come in the first place. So he's not going to hesitate. He's not going to hesitate. He will come because we're asking him to come for those reasons. So let's ask him. Why not? Wherever we are, wherever we're gathered, my sense is from what I've read, from what I've experienced in my own uh, journey of faith, he's present even as we gather for worship this morning, he's here. Already the Holy Spirit of God is doing what the Holy Spirit of God does. He's moving in our midst. He's quickening our hearts. He's affirming a need in us. He is challenging us to think about our next yes to him, our next step in the journey of faith. He's already sensing in us a pleading that he might come to us for one or any or all of those reasons. And the beautiful thing about this God of love and grace is he comes knowing exactly what we need and delivering it to us because he loves us and our names are written on the palm of his hand. And so in these moments of our worship, we ask him to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, increase our faith. Cleanse our hearts. Empower us to love. Empower us for mission. And grant to us that which we cannot do for ourselves because it's divine and can only come from your hand. So if you love us, Lord, as you demonstrated that you do. Come now. Come now, Holy Spirit. And meet us where we are. Let us pray together. <coughs> Beautiful Father in heaven, we praise your holy name. We acknowledge in your presence that you are great and powerful and majestic and beyond our full comprehension. But you've made yourself known to us through your written word. You've made yourself known to us through your son, Jesus, our savior. We know that you're a God of love and mercy and grace. And we celebrate that in your presence this morning. But we acknowledge this morning, Father, that you are on mission to reclaim those and that which belongs to you. And you are establishing your kingdom. And so when we ask your spirit to come, we're asking you to come because we want to get on board with that. We're asking you to come to increase our faith, to cleanse our hearts, to help us to love one another, and to prepare us for mission, to grant us courage to engage. Father, as we worship you, as we sing to you, as we offer you our praise in these moments, I pray that you will minister to us and create the space for us to seek you, to kneel in your presence, to make our prayer, to offer ourselves to you afresh. Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. Come down, come down. Fall on us afresh, we pray. In Jesus' beautiful name. Here I pray.